You ever wish you could walk through the old Yankee Stadium before the crowds got there to get a little taste of what it was like behind the scenes? Down the ramps, the hallways. Well, now you can. I'm Stuart J. Zola, and in my life in Yankee Stadium, 40 years as a vendor, and other tales of growing up somewhat sane in the Bronx, you get an inside look at a baseball monument. For 2,500 events, I sold everything. Beer, hot dogs, whatever. Hey, Peanuts here, get your peanuts. World Series games, a Muhammad Ali fight. Hey, I was even there when the Pope showed up. Hey, rosary beads here, rosary beads. My life in Yankee Stadium, 40 years as a vendor, and other tales of growing up somewhat sane in the Bronx. Hey, beer here, cold beer. Fifty years ago, in 1970, I started working at Yankee Stadium, where I was a vendor for over 2,500 events. It's all right here in my memoir, My Life in Yankee Stadium. 40 years as a vendor and other tales of growing up somewhat sane in the Bronx. I sold everything from peanuts to hot chocolate, Cracker Jacks, ice cream, hot dogs, beer, with my giant can opener, and in later years, souvenirs. And thanks to Todd, I would like to share a few stories with you here today. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Yankee Stadium. Now, oftentimes, the Yankees, the Yankee fans in a section, take on a personality of their own. And the crowd in the Bronx bleachers was, and still is, like no other. Over the years, they have come to be known as the bleacher creatures, and for good reason. They still are a core group of about 40 or 50, and they have rarely missed a single game. Whenever the Yankees take the field for a home game, the creatures cheer for each position player, one at a time, in a roll call. The tradition continued into the new ballpark, as when Derek Jeter got the shot out. Now batting for the Indians, number two, Derek Jeter. Derek Jeter. Derek Jeter. A Rod. A Rod. The creatures go right on through the whole lineup, calling out each player in the field during the opening minutes of the first inning. And the cheer continues until the player being lauded flicks his cap, waves, or acknowledges them somehow. Since 1996, it's become a tradition at the ballpark. Now, though the creatures are a boisterous lot, they have their own rules. Back when the dance along song, the Macarena was popular, it was played with the fans in the stands up on their feet and moving to the beat. Needless to say, the creatures, traditionalists all the way, would have no part of it. They also abhor the wave. With many tourists in attendance at games, it's become common for the fans to unite and get involved with this section by section cheer, but the bleacher creatures remain defiant. Even when the whole ballpark participates and every level of the stadium rises and sits in unison like a large wave, the bleacher fans stay seated when it becomes their turn, often causing boos to cascade upon them. They are a principal lot, and their, refusable, their refusal to participate implies, eh, if you people want to wave, go back where you came from and wave all you want. Though the sale of beer was forbidden in the bleachers during the final few seasons at the old ballpark, sobriety didn't stop the creatures from being rowdy. I often heard them yelling to other sections, box seats suck, box seats suck. One night, the fans in the box seats answered them with a, get a job, get a job. Man, I miss New York. The 
throughout its history, a number of events have taken place in the ballpark, including prize fights, college football games, and religious gatherings. My dad, who worked there in the 30s and once sold Babe Ruth six hot dogs before a game, told me many times of the intense rivalries between Army, Navy, and Notre Dame. He also told me that his brother, my Uncle Abe, worked there for a time, and even during my tenure, I helped get two of my nephews in when they were teenagers. But no one in my family hung in there nearly as long as I did. Cash was tight when my dad worked back in the 30s, and he used to tell me if the scorecard he was selling was three cents and someone in the middle of the row would buy one with a dime, dad sometimes gave back only six cents change. That way, if an exciting play was occurring at that very moment, the fan might mindlessly put the change in his pocket and my dad would scurry off with the extra cent. But if the fan began to count his change, dad would quickly send that extra penny down the row. <laughs> Life for a post-depression era kid, I suppose. I would often think of him whenever I'd get past a $10 bill from a row of people for a $9 beer. I would slowly prepare to pass the single as I, I looked for a sign from the customer to keep it. I didn't hold back the money like he did, but times change. He waited on pennies, me on dollar bills. I worked other events such as rock concerts featuring Pink Floyd, Billy Joel, and U2. Aside from t-shirts and hats, I recall selling condoms for the U2 concert. Hey, condoms here, get your condoms. In 1979, I had the honor to work when Pope John Paul II came to celebrate mass. That day, I had souvenirs and sold all sorts of items like photos, pennants, t-shirts. My stand was in the upper deck and I came out to the seats for a moment so I could catch a glimpse of the Pope down on the field while a security guard kept an eye on my inventory. I will never forget how quiet it was. More than 50,000 people perfectly still during the ceremony. I'd been at the stadium for nearly 10 years by that point, so I was used to hearing loud cheering and screaming, but I'd never been there when it was so eerily silent. The next day, the Pope, after speaking at the United Nations, went to Queens and visited Shea Stadium, home of the Mets. Fellow vendors who worked both ballparks often spoke of the fact that there were torrential rains all that day, which threatened to completely ruin the event. But as those who attended his mass at Shea have sworn to, when the Pope Mobile came on the field, the rain stopped. The sun subsequently came out as his holiness hit the stage. Being Jewish, I was nervous at the Pope's visit to the Bronx wanting to say the right thing in the right way to the various nuns and priests at the event. As they passed by my stand in the hallway, I was on my very best behavior. But I always tell my friends about how I broke the ice after the first solemn hour by yelling out, hey, rosary beads here, rosary beads. Uh, no pushing. One at a time, sister. I didn't say that last part. You two the Pope, I guess business is business. In 2008, the final year of the old stadium, Pope Benedict came to conduct mass, but unfortunately, I wasn't allowed to vend. In the 21st century, the Pope brings in his own souvenirs and his own vendors. I guess the papal business has become big business. The city graciously welcomed him all around town, but I had to laugh when I was driving on the Harlem River Drive and I saw a traffic sign posted that read, Pope visit at Yankee Stadium, use mass transportation. Visits from the Pope, football games and concerts aside, it was ultimately baseball that was the focus of my 40 summers at the stadium. Every Memorial Day, 4th of July and Labor Day weekend, for all those years, if the Yanks were home, I was there vending to thousands and thousands of fans. And over time, I've come to realize that Lou Gehrig, Joe DiMaggio, Mickey Mantle, and Derek Jeter all played their entire careers as Yankees. 
but not one of them worked as many games in the Bronx as I did. MVP. Now, having worked more than 2,500 events at Yankee Stadium, I can say most of the games were usually routine with the occasional pitcher's duel here and a few back-to-back -back triples there. However, some nights were different from others. For instance, I was there when Chris Shambliss hit his penny-winning home run in 1976 against the Kansas City Royals. The field was so swarmed with fans that after the blast, Shambliss had to return to the field from the locker room to touch home plate in front of an umpire. I remember the thrill of Yogi coming home after having been exiled by George Steinbrenner for more than 14 years. I saw various no-hitters, over 20 old-timers games, the gay games in 94 celebrating gay athletes, Charlie Hayes smothering a pop-up to clinch the 96 championship, Aaron Boone's dramatic home run of the Red Sox in 2003, among so many others. Another day I won't forget was August 3rd, 1979, the day after Thurman Munson was killed in a plane crash in Toledo, Ohio. Munson had been a, a hero of mine, a, a gritty ball player who did whatever he could to avoid the spotlight in New York, often flying home to Ohio to be with his family on his off days. During a moment of silence for the Yankee captain, I watched Lou Pinella break down in tears in left field from my station near section 20 in the lower deck. I actually couldn't finish work that game because I was so shaken over his tragic death. My diary from that mournful time read, he was fat, he was not very good looking, he didn't play up to the press, but he tried. Boy, did he try. I could still see him stretching from first to third on a single to center and belly whopping into the bag, invariably safe. I related to Thurman. I had been a catcher in Little League. I was chunky. I played tough. And I too was pretty ugly. I always took Thurman's side in arguments and somehow I could feel what he was going through in that Yankee dugout, sensing his fear and dislike for Reggie Jackson. I understood Thurman Munson's terribly private ordeal, trying to simply play ball without wanting to be on the cover of a magazine, avoiding the fanfare in a town that breathes glamor and ignores dedication. His death signifies to me how difficult life really is, how hard it is to do what you want, to love and maintain your family and still do your job. The American dream drags onward. Some nights were memorable for other reasons, such as when I sang Johnny Be Good to a whole section in the upper deck and managed to get them all up on their feet to do a sing-along. <laughs> now that was fun, hearing them do Chuck Berry's hit, but the incident got me suspended for three games. Curious thing was, at around the same time, another vendor had stolen a key to the peanut storage room, and he also was docked three games. I came into work after my suspension a few days later, and someone said I should have been in on the peanut room heist. At least he could have made a few bucks. At another game, I witnessed a beer vendor confronted by a fan who was part of a group of Hell's Angels. Now, sometimes these angels can be surprisingly charming, but this one happened to be more of the stereotypical multi-tattooed gigantic Igor type. He wasn't happy with the service, got upset, and proceeded to lift this vendor two feet into the air, beer tray and all. Suddenly, a fellow angel grunted, hey, if you kill him, he can't get us any more beer. That brought Igor to his senses, and the frightened vendor was gently placed down, unharmed. You think dealing with the public is easy? Forget about it. Now, a game takes on a personality of its own. And a Tuesday night crowd in June, for some unknown reason, could be cheap or generous. It was hard to tell until the first or second inning. Invariably, Red Sox and Oriole fans were always good customers, no matter what day it was. Usually, Friday night fans were late, presumably stopping for a drink after getting their paychecks. 
Asian fans may buy out a whole section, but if any of them happened to buy a beer, they would usually sip it for the whole game, which, of course, is not good for business. In addition, though one might think these are stereotypes, it was often assumed Japanese fans don't tip, European fans also don't tip, and Met fans barely even buy. Vendor lingo is common. Hot dogs were often referred to as puppies. Cotton candy was called calories on a stick, and soda was known as sugar water. When a crowd was cheap, we vendors said the fans were waiting for the quarters. <laughs> that referred to the fact that instead of telling us to keep the change, the customer hung around after paying for their item and were therefore waiting for the quarters. If an item was $5.75, for instance, that subway of a quarter, subway is what we call the tip, could add up on a busy night of ending. And one reason why I was able to recognize a cheap customer is I used to be one myself back in my day, climbing up to the grandstand as a fan, carrying my little paper bag with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, an apple, and my notebook, saving me my quarter so I didn't spend it buying a score card. Now, one more thought. There was a great jazz pianist years ago named Earl Father Hines, who used to say, if you have holes in the bottom of your shoes, shine the tops. One night I was selling beer in the middle of a grueling 10-day homestand when a fellow vendor routinely called out, hey Budweiser here, real beer. When I heard him make his call, I noticed something and I tapped him on the shoulder. Dave, I hate to tell you, but you're selling Miller Lite tonight. With this newfound knowledge, he immediately called out, light beer for Miller, less calories here. I mentioned this because Dave, a bit fatigued from one game to the next, hadn't even checked to see which beer he was selling on this particular night. He had been extolling the virtues of Budweiser, which had been his product the previous game, and he was able to make the quick shift to pitch what he was currently serving, Miller Lite, once he became aware of it. Never doubt the ability of a good vendor to switch gears on the fly, shine in the tops. Now, April 17, 1968, was one day at Shea Stadium that I will never forget. All one had to do was see Willie Mays play to know he was a special talent, the best of his day. He not only could hit for average, he could also hit with power, he could run, he could field, and he could throw. Those are the five essentials of a complete player. And in Willie's case, he did it with such enthusiasm and love for the game, it was quite simply a joy to watch him. Everything he did was exciting. Tallulah Bankhead once said, there have been only two geniuses in the world, Willie Mays and Willie Shakespeare. In describing the very first home run Willie hit in 1951, his manager, Leo DeRocher said, I never saw a fucking ball leave a fucking park so fucking fast in my fucking life. Willie Mays was my boyhood idol. No fucking doubt about it. Now this brisk April day back in 1968, I took the seven train out to Queens with my two pals, Billy and Arnold. We hung out to get autographs after the game, of course, and to be honest, I don't even remember who won. What I definitely do remember is seeing Willie coming out of the press gate, a pack of kids trailing him as he headed to his pink Lincoln Continental, signing autographs all along the way. I immediately took off after him, but the crowd of people around the car was thick. Willie got in the passenger side, his driver started the engine, and the people began to peel off. But I was 12, hadn't a worry in the world, and didn't know or even care where Billy and Arnold were, so I clung to that Continental like a terrier to a milkman. Luckily, the traffic leaving the parking lot prevented Willie from exiting quickly. I waited patiently, and he continued to sign at his window for the group of us that had followed alongside his car. For me, 
that signature was gold. Upon coming back to earth, I suddenly realized I got to tell the guys. So I scrambled across the parking lot, back near the press gate, till I breathlessly reached Billy and Arnold, who were waiting there to get other players' autographs. Well, guys, you won't believe it. Oh, look at this. Willie Mays. Oh, he signed oh, my program. He signed my program. Boom. Those guys were off, flying to the edge of the parking lot, hunting down Willie's car. By the time they came back a few minutes later, after successfully meeting up with him, I was sitting at the curb, staring at my treasure, transfixed by my hero's beautiful penmanship. May still had an effect on me right into adulthood. When Reggie Jackson was retired and had a plaque dedicated him to him in Monument Park in 2002, he was celebrated with Reggie Jackson Day at the stadium. For the occasion, he asked for and received Willie Mays as one of his personal guests for the event. I had a souvenir stand in the upper deck that day and wasn't aware he was going to be attending, but on Reggie's day, when I heard Willie's name over the loudspeaker, I ran straight out to the stands to see the great one once again. I had left my souvenirs completely unattended, thousands of dollars worth of stock vulnerable to theft. Just the mention of his name on the loudspeaker had me reacting like a kid again the same way Billy and Arnold reacted back in 1968. Now I mentioned him earlier, so I don't wanna leave without sharing a short Yogi story. Yogi Berra, of course, had some great lines attributed to, to him or about him. He famously used to say about a Midwest town, it gets later, Take two. About a Midwest town, he said, it gets late early out there. Or about a restaurant. Nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded. When he was asked whether he preferred to be buried or cremated, his response was, surprise me. Now, as the story goes, one time he was in Chicago on a road trip during a very hot summer. On this particular day, he was in the team's hotel lobby wearing a white seersucker suit, the perfect outfit for the sticky, humid weather. The team owner's wife happened to be strolling through the lobby when she saw him and she said, hi, Yogi, my, you look quite cool and comfortable in that suit in this weather. Yogi, quick on the trigger replied, you don't look so hot yourself. 